All right, now in Galatians chapter 6, of course, we're, we're memorizing this chapter. And the verse I want to point out here is, um, what's our reading in, in verse number 2? The Bible says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. <clears throat> For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So we start off here in this chapter. And he's telling us, you know, basically do your own work. He's saying you need to work, you need to work hard, and you need to do your work. And he says, um, you know, if a man thinks himself to be something when he's really nothing, he deceives himself. So don't think like too highly of yourself. You know, he said you need to do your own work. And also not just do your own work, but, you know, um, do other people's works. He says, so fulfill the law of Christ. Um, bear ye one another's burdens. Right? So you should be focused first and foremost on doing your work. But then also helping other people with their work. But he says, then later in verse 7, he says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So he's saying, the reason why he's starting off talking about your work and the things that you do and work hard and, and help other people in their burdens is because the things that you do, the works that you do, you're sowing. I mean, you're doing something. You know, you're sowing your works. You're sowing the things that you're doing. So he's saying, be careful. To be, to don't be deceived because God's not mocked. He says, whatsoever you're sowing, whatever you're doing, whatever kind of work you're doing, he says, that's also what you're going to reap. So that's why he starts off telling us, you know, let every man prove his own work, right? Do your own work, do what's right. And he says, God's not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And this is something as a Christian, and this is being taught to, to the church, this is taught to Christians. Hey, look, I know that you're saved, right? I know that Jesus Christ has paid for all of your sins. But we need to remember that God is not mocked still. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap that again. If you decide to just, to just thumb your nose at God and, and, just, and just not do anything He wants you to do, and just, and just sow to the flesh and just, and just sow to sin, He says you're going to reap that. It's going to come back to you. You're going to receive for what you do in your body. So be careful with what you're doing and be careful with the works that you're doing. Now, what I'm preaching about this morning ultimately is, is taking responsibility for your own actions. Okay, just, just the things that you do, you're responsible for those. And first and foremost, in Romans chapter 1, the Bible explains how we are all responsible for our own salvations. God holds us responsible. That's why, I mean, we're responsible for our own sins, and we're responsible for getting saved. The Bible says in, um, in Romans 1, it says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans chapter 1, and that's in verse 20. Romans 1 explains, there's a lot of, a lot of content in Romans 1, but it kind of talks about people who become reprobate, people who reject God. And it's saying right here, it's saying, look, the invisible things from God, from the creation of the world, ever since God created the entire world, these things that he created that are clearly seen, and they're understood by the things that he made, meaning like us, right? We understand the things, the invisible things that God created. We were made by God. It says, even his eternal power in Godhead. God is evident in this life. He says, we can understand that. I mean, he's given us that knowledge and that ability to just understand. When you look around, when you look at the perfection in creation, you know, you have to be a fool, to reject that and to say, no, this all just happened by chance. Right. God has given us that ability to, to understand. And he's given us more than enough proof to, to, to know that God exists. I mean, you'd have to just willingly want to reject him and, and, just, and just completely want to shut God out of your mind in order to even think that, this stuff, to think that his creation came from nothing. Because he's given us plenty of evidence... He tells us, I mean, the Bible is the truth, and God himself, you know, is the author of the Bible. And in Romans 1, he's saying that, you know, it's, you can understand this. 
you can understand that the things that are made, even as eternal power of Godhead, you can understand the Godhead, you can understand God and, and the Creator that made everything. He said, so that they are without excuse. You have no excuse to, to, to say, oh, well, I didn't know about God. He says, you, you, no, you don't have that excuse. I've made it evident for you in the very creation itself. It's there. It's evident. So, first and foremost, we are responsible for that. We know that there's a God. And, you know, uh, we ought to, you know, try to seek God out and understand Him. And, and when you hear about God, not reject it. When you hear about Jesus Christ, not reject it. So, um, that is our responsibility. And God holds us liable for our own sins as well, which is why people go to hell. For those two reasons, for your sins and for not, not accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, um, see, people have an attitude these days, and that's just, that's just my first point. I'll, I'll kind of get off the salvation point, but it's, it's critical to mention that. Uh, turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 30. But see, people these days have an attitude where they want to just absolve themselves of all wrongdoing. Right. Right? It's like they, they don't want to take responsibility for anything. They just kind of think that like, oh, you know, the things that I do, that's, that's not my fault. There's all, it's always somebody else's fault. People are always willing and looking to point the finger at someone else instead of just pointing the finger back at yourself. Right? People are going through hard times. You know, maybe they're struggling financially or whatever's going on. They can't seem to hold a job down. It's always someone else's fault. Right? It's always... This other guy, oh, this other person's out to get me. Oh, there's, you know, nothing ever goes my way. It's always just, just bad luck or just by chance, nothing, you know. And no one ever wants to take, you know, put the focus back on themselves and say, well, wait, maybe it's myself. Maybe there's something that I'm doing. You know, if things just continually happen and go wrong, 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 maybe it's time to just take a look and just be like, well, wait, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not as good as I think I am. Maybe I am doing something wrong here. And in Proverbs 30, verse 12, the Bible says, There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. So this is talking about people who, in their own eyes, when they look at themselves, they just think, hey, I'm pure. I'm good. Man, I'm righteous. Everything I do, I'm, I'm just good. I, I mean, I don't understand why these bad things are happening. I don't know what's going on, but I know I'm good. And it says that they think they're pure in their own eyes. It says, yet they're not even washed from their own filthiness. You know, a lot of people out there, especially people who are unsaved, they think that, you know, you talk to people at the door, you think they're going to heaven based on their good works. They think, hey, I'm a good person. I help people out. I help animals and stuff. They're righteous in their own eyes. They think, hey, I'm a really good person. Yet they don't even understand that they're not even washed from their filthiness. God looks at them and just like, you think you're good? You're a sinner. I mean, you, you're going to go to hell. And you're going to pay for your sins because you're not even washed. You, you, you can't trust your own righteousness. But then it says, you know, in verse 13, it says, how lofty are their eyes. See, ultimately, that type of an attitude is a proud attitude. That's one where you're thinking really highly of yourself. You're looking at yourself and thinking, man, I'm so great. I'm so, you know, I'm, my works are so good. I'm so righteous. You know, I'm not doing anything wrong. I am just so good. And your mind just gets puffed up. Your, your, your heart gets, gets lifted up. Your eyelids are lifted up here. It says you're lofty. You have this, this proud attitude. And this is the attitude that doesn't understand then when people don't understand why bad things will happen to them. Because they think, oh, well, I'm so good and I'm so righteous. It's a, a poor me attitude too. Like people have that, that oh, I, you know, everything's happening to me. And they get so focused on themselves and there are many, you know, there's a lot of wrong things with that type of thinking. Now, um, we're going to see an example here. If you guys remember the story of Job, Job's a good example. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm saying a lot, of, a lot of negative things here about a bad attitude and a poor attitude. Job had a good attitude. Job in, in chapter 1, you don't have to turn there. If you would, turn to Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter 2. But in Job chapter 1, if you remember the story of Job, of course, the Bible says that Job was righteous. He was a righteous man. He was doing what was right. He was doing, or in God's eyes, you know, obviously he wasn't perfect. He was still a sinner. But he was doing good. I mean, he was, he was obeying God's laws to the best of his ability. He was going the right direction. He was doing everything that he was supposed to be doing. God called him righteous. God was even saying to Satan, he's like, hey, have you considered my servant Job? You know, there's none like him on all the earth. He was the most righteous man living on the earth. But 
He had all kinds of bad things happen to him. I mean, the Bible explains he lost his wealth, he lost his livestock, he lost his family, his ten children, all of them. That, you know, like everything just came crashing down in one day. And then he was, you know, the devil afflicted him and, and put all these sores, and he lost his health, and he was itchy and miserable and pain and all this other stuff. Yet Job's attitude in Job chapter 1 Verse 21, the Bible says, and, and he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. See, here's a man who went through more hardship than you and I will probably ever go through. I mean, he lost everything. He lost his children. He got, I mean, he was just sitting in, in sackcloth and ashes, just itchy, People just saw him, and they would just start crying at the sight of him. I mean, it, it, was, it was misery. It was miserable. Right? So it, everything went wrong for him. Even his wife turned on him and said, you know, you still retain your integrity, curse God, and die. But Job handled that situation appropriately. He did what was right, and that's why the Bible says he didn't charge God foolishly. See, a lot of people these days... And in general, and you can kind of understand why it would happen, but you got to be careful about this. People will think, all of these bad things are happening to me. Why are you doing this to me, God? And you start charging God with the things that are going wrong in your life. And it might be extreme. You might have all these things happening. And you could say, why are you doing this to me, God? But that would be foolish. That would be extremely foolish for Job to have said that to God. Because was God the one that was causing all these bad things to happen to him? No. No. It was Satan. Satan was the one that was attacking Job. Satan was the one that was bringing all this stuff to come to pass on him. Job was doing that which was right, but it wasn't God that was doing it. God's not the one that, that, that afflicted Job. Now, God allowed it to happen, but he's not the source of the problem. The, the devil was the source of the problem. He was the one that was accusing Job. He was the one that was, that was bringing all this, this pain and suffering on him. So it would have been extremely foolish for Job to just charge God and say, why are you doing all this stuff to me, God? Why, is, why did I lose my family? Why, you know, and, just, and just having that type of an attitude. Job didn't have that type of an attitude. But see, when you start getting this, this poor me type of an attitude, which, again, I mean, I can have empathy for someone going through that situation because it's so difficult and because it would be kind of hard to imagine, man, what would I, what, you know, what would I be like? If everything just went south and everything just went bad. I don't know, but I, but I would hope and pray that I would do what was right like Job did. And we have a good example that Job is. And see, one of the problems with having this, this attitude where you start wondering, like, why is all this stuff happening to me? It's a very self-centered attitude because what you're focusing on is the wrong thing. When, when all these bad things happen, yeah, I mean... It's, again, it's extremely terrible, and I have empathy. But you can't focus on the things that are being done and happening to you so much. You can't dwell on that and, and, just, and, and focus on that and let that fester because that's just going to bring you down, and that's going to get you depressed, and that's just going to lead you down into a way of thinking that you're just thinking about yourself, ultimately. I mean, you think about, you're thinking about all the bad things that happen to yourself. It's very self-centered. Focus on yourself. Look at Philippians 2, chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. See, the Bible is admonishing us that we need to keep our mind focused, not on yourself, but on the things of others. Right? I mean, Jesus Christ came, he was a minister. What does a minister mean? It means you're ministering to someone else. You're, putting, you're serving them. Jesus Christ became a servant to serve us when he came on this, on, on this earth to, to save you know, to save the world from sins. He didn't exalt himself. He served others. And he gave us an example of how we should follow. And the Bible's telling us here that we need to have lowliness of mind, esteeming others better than ourselves. 
So we need to be more focused on making sure other people are going to succeed. That is more. That is the Christ-like attitude that we have to have because he suffered, he endured, he went through all kinds of suffering and pain and sleepless nights and not and and all kinds of hardships, beating, right, mocking, ridicule, all kinds of shame, all kinds of, of, of torture, you know, being hung on the cross, and it was all to serve someone else. He had this, this lowliness of mind. He was esteeming us better than himself, which that in itself is just amazing because this is God in the flesh. I mean, God the creator, God who made heaven and earth, God who made us, came and showed us an example and, and, and was really esteeming us better than him. We deserve hell. Right. We deserve a punishment. And out of his love for us, he esteemed us so much. He, he, he thought about us so much that he <coughs> went through all these things that he didn't have to go through. He didn't deserve to go through. He deserved none of it. Yet offered himself up to pay for us. And see, that's the example that we have. Now, if you're thinking about other people and esteeming other people so much, when bad things are to happen, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's not going to affect you. I'm not saying you're not going to be sad. I'm not saying, you know, it's, it, everything will just be fine. But what you need to have, if you, if, you, if you have this proper attitude, if you're still not quite just focused on all the bad things that are happening to yourself, you can still be thinking about other things and say, even in all of these, this turmoil and grief and everything else that we're going through, hey, maybe I can help somebody else. Maybe I can do something for them. And, and that is a healthy attitude to have because that's going to help you get through your hard times and your struggles. When you have that type of an attitude, that will help lift you up. And, and I'll tell you, if you've never been out soul winning before, if you've never led a person to Christ, you, experience, you receive a joy from that that you can't explain in words unless you actually go out and do it yourself. Okay, when you... You know, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's absolutely true. And anyone who, who is who is really giving something, really put some, any kind of thought and effort and time into like giving a gift to somebody or just caring about someone and just, and just from your heart doing something really nice for them, you know that that lifts your own spirit. <clears throat> when you know that you can be a blessing to someone else and you can help them out and you can see what an impact you're having in their life, and you can see, hey man, I gave them something, I did something for them, I helped them out when they really just, just needed, needed someone to help them. And you can see that. You receive a great joy and a great blessing just from, just from being able to participate, just from being able to help them. And when you have this type of an attitude where you're esteeming others better than yourselves, when you're thinking about other people, when all the bad things start to happen to you, you can still get some comfort through those times when you're not focused just on yourself. See, when you start focusing on yourself, it's going to be this downward spiral of depression and misery. You're just going to start thinking about it like, man, why are all these bad things happening? And if you just keep on focused on those negative things, you're just going to get more, you're just going to get more and more grieved and more and more sad and, and get to a point where it's going to be hard to even come out of that. But if you have this attitude where you're thinking about other people, he says, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ then it's going to help you to get through those times. It's going to build you up. Now, um, like I said earlier, on Job's situation, he wasn't the source of the problem. And he wasn't being chastised or disciplined for his own sins. That's not why he was going through what he was doing. He was actually being attacked for serving God. Which will happen to you if you decide to live godly and, just, and live righteous life like Job was doing. Hey, the devil's going to come and try to attack you. You go through this time. So he actually serves as a good example for us. But let's turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 20, because we're going to see here a different example. That's an example, Job's example of a righteous man. Job's example of what we should be doing. And the attitude that we should have, we find in Philippians 2. But let's look at a different example, <coughs> because probably more often than not, bad things happen in your life, but more of a result of your own sins than of just being attacked by someone else. That's probably more likely. And this is where we don't want to have that attitude either of, of you know, why are these things happening to us when you first, first and foremost just check yourself and, what, and what's going on. Numbers chapter 20, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why 
have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us in unto this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. So here we see the children of Israel complaining, right? This is after they've been, they've been led out of Egypt, and now they're wandering around in the wilderness. And in Numbers 20, they've actually, they've been wandering around for a long time. They've been going from place to place, and they continue, continually complain, continually murmur against God and against Moses. And look at who they're pointing, and they always want to point the blame off on someone else, right? They're saying like, you know, oh, I wish God would have just, they would have just killed us. You know, like, it would have been better if we would have just died. They're like, why are you leading us out here? Now there's no water. Now we can't, now we're going to thirst to death. Verse number four, it says, and why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? It's like, why have you done this? Why are you bringing us over here? Why are you bringing us into the wilderness? And wherefore have ye, talking about, you know, Moses and Aaron, made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us in unto this evil place. And then they're starting to say, like, look, you told us it was going to be like this, you know, the, this promise I had that it's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. They're like, it's not of seed or figs or vines or pomegranates. He said, there's not even any water here. They're saying to say, like, oh, you lied to us. Why, you know, why are you bringing us out here? Why are we in this place now? Why are you leading us into this place? But see, whose fault was it really that they were wandering around the wilderness for so long? It wasn't, it wasn't Moses' fault. It wasn't Aaron's fault. It was their own fault. Yet they're going and they're going to be blaming Moses. They're going to be blaming Aaron. They're going to be blaming God. Oh, why are you bringing us out as well? Oh, you're, you know, you're treating us bad. Oh, we don't have any water to drink. We don't have any food. We don't have anything to, you know. Why are all these bad things happening to us? It was their own fault. Turn to Numbers 14. Just go back a few chapters. See, that was in Numbers 20. We see them complaining. They're complaining all throughout Exodus and all throughout Numbers. Numbers uh, 14. See, in Numbers 13 is when the spies come back from, from spying out the land. Moses sends out the, you know, these, these princes of the children of Israel to go spy out the land. They were supposed to go, the land that they were going to inherit, the promised land. He sends them out saying, we're going to check it out. We're going to make a plan, you know, see what the people are like. We're going to make a plan of attack because they're going to go in. They're going to take over and just get a report of the land. Just come back and just tell us what it's like. So they basically come back and 10 of the 12 say, we can't do this. They say, there's giants in the land. You know, there's, it's just too much for us. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way we could beat these guys. There's no way we could defeat them. It's just forget about it. We can't do it. And just, it just had this bad report, this evil report of saying that we can't do it. And going against God's will and just saying we can't do this. Now, of course, um, Joshua and Caleb said otherwise. They said we could. But um, they, you know, ultimately they lacked the faith that God was going to fulfill the promise when he promised them to be brought into that land. Look at Numbers 14, verse number 1. See, Numbers 13, that's where they bring the evil report. Now in verse number 1. Just after these people hear the report that they bring up, it says in verse 1, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. <coughs> and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness. Sound familiar? Sounds like what we just read in, in Numbers chapter 20, right? Their attitude hasn't changed at all, Numbers 20 from Numbers 14. So the people hear this report, and it says, All the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. That's, they're complaining against Moses, they're complaining against Aaron. Notice it doesn't say that they're complaining against God. They're putting all the blame and the focus on Moses and Aaron. But I mean, who's the one that, that did all the miracles and, and provided their way even out of Egypt and led them from that slavery? It's God that... that that was using Moses to, to perform the miracles. They saw the Red Sea parted. They saw all the, the, mirror, the miraculous events that happened. But now they're going to be here. Oh, we're going to blame Moses. We're going to blame Aaron. Verse 3, it says, And wherefore the Lord brought us unto this land, to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. So the land that just came out, I mean, what a foolish thought is that? First of all, like, I mean... Egypt came after them with their whole army, chasing after them, trying to kill them. Right. They wanted them dead, and they're like, let's go back into Egypt. 
I mean, they saw the miracles. They saw God raise the Red Sea and this entire army, God destroyed this entire army of the Egyptians because he didn't want them to be in Egypt and God was protecting them. And now they're saying, hey, let's, let's go back into Egypt. As if they'd even be received warmly anyways. I mean, the, uh, every firstborn male died in Egypt, which is why they came running after him trying to kill them all. Let's go back into Egypt because we're hungry, because there's this battle, because these people are just, just look too tough for us. We're going to go back into Egypt. It's ridiculous. Let's, uh, let's keep reading here in Numbers 14. Look at verse number 5. Or, yeah, verse number... Well, we're going to skip ahead a little bit because Joshua and Caleb basically... Go to verse number 8. Basically, Joshua and Caleb try to convince them and they say, you know, you can inherit the land. You know, if God wants us to get, have this, we can have this. Verse number 8 says, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Say, look, if God is, wants us to have this, he's going to make sure it happens. That's what they're saying. And verse 9 says, only rebel not ye against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bad stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. See, God wants to destroy these people <coughs> because of their unbelieving and their murmuring attitude. That's why God wants to destroy them. They have this bad attitude where they're thinking, oh man, we can't do this. Oh man, all these bad things are happening to us. Oh, we just want to go back into Egypt. You know, they're complaining. They're putting blame on Moses. They're putting blame on Aaron. You know, when they should just be looking to them own, their own selves. And because of this attitude, God wants to destroy them. God just saying, look, I'm done with these people. Moses, I'm just going to build a new nation from you. Just, just let me destroy all these people. They had this attitude of, you know, why did you bring us into this wilderness? Why don't we have all these different kinds of food that we used to eat in Egypt? You know, why, why, um, why do we have all these difficulties? Why are things so hard? Why have you made things so hard for us, Moses? That's the attitude that they had, and that's the attitude that God hated. And they were blaming other people for the predicament that they were in. They were putting the blame on everybody else. Now, thankfully for them, Moses decides to intercede. Moses steps in because God's ready to kill these people. God is ready to, he's like, I'm done with them. Step aside, Moses, I'm going to kill them. Moses has an extremely <coughs> humble attitude. And again, like we saw in Philippians 2, Moses had possessed this attitude where he esteemed others better than himself. He saw the evil that was going to come on these people, and they just had got done saying that they wanted to stone them with stones. Here's a whole mob, a whole group of people that want to kill Moses. They're literally ready to pick up stones and throw it at him and, and kill him and murder Moses. When God steps in and he's going to kill them now, Moses says, wait, don't do it. He intercedes for him. He, he still has that type of love and compassion for the people to ask God, just God, please don't do this. Even though they wanted to kill him, he still esteemed them better than himself. That's the type of attitude that Moses had. And that's the type of attitude that we ought to have too. It says, it says in verse 19, um, this is Moses speaking, he said, Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt, even until now. And verse 20 says, And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. So God listened to Moses. And this is important too. I mean, this is a prayer that Moses makes because God was going to kill the people. He was going to do it. But because Moses interceded, because he decided to step in, God changed his mind. And this shows what is one good example of the power of prayer and speaking to God and asking God for things because God will listen to you. God hears prayer. And he listened to Moses. And he, I mean, that's a huge course of action. That Moses individually was able to, to ask God to do something, not to do something, and God didn't do it. Huge. I mean, wiping out all of those children of Israel, Moses prevented that by his prayer. And God pardoned him. It says in verse 21, it says, But as truly as I live, 
All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Now, the, here's a, a very important truth for us to understand. Because even though God pardoned their iniquity by not destroying them, they still were going to get chastened. And they still were going to reap what they sowed. Right? They still, what they did, you know, God's not mocked. When well, we started off in Galatians 6, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. God pardoned them. Right? And this, is, this could be a similar picture of salvation. You know, we get pardoned from our sins when we receive Christ as our Savior. Right? Those sins, He's not going to destroy us. He's not going to send us to hell. Okay? Once you receive Christ, they're paid for. However, when you live in sin, and when you still do, you know, when you still do these wicked things, it doesn't mean there's no consequences. He still will cause, you know, you're still going to end up reaping what you sow. Just like these people, he said, okay, I'm going to pardon them. I'm going to forgive them for what they've done, according to my mercy, yet, but they're not going to get, they're not going to go into the promised land. They're not going to go into this land where I was leading them to. He says, they're not going to see it. Now, the children will go see it, but they're not going to go see it. Verse number 24 says, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whither he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. Tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. So he's saying, look, because you did this, because they've been murmuring, because of their complaining, because of all the sin they've been doing, you didn't destroy them, you pardoned that. He says, but they're not going to come in here. He said, everyone from twenty years old and upward... He says they're, um, they're not going to come into the land. He says the only people that are going to go are Caleb and Joshua because they did that which was right. They tried to persuade the people. They didn't bring an evil report. He says in verse 31, But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, because they were saying, you know, you brought us in this land and God's going to kill us. God's going to kill our children. So they're thinking, you know, they didn't have any faith in God and they're thinking God's going to, you know, that all of our children are going to be destroyed. He says, your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. So he's saying, you thought your kids were going to kill? I'm going to bring your kids into the promised land. I'll show you. you know, this, I'm, going to, I'm going to perform my word, and they are going to go in. You thought they were going to be killed by trusting in your own efforts and your own flesh, but I'm going to, I'm going to show you that they're, they, they will come into the promised land. He says in verse 32, But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. Now, this is also important to understand here, because here we see the children of Israel, ultimately, and this is back from what we read in Numbers 20 when they were complaining about this. They brought this upon themselves. Their lack of faith in God, they're, they're, they're wanting to go back into Egypt, they're complaining, they're murmuring, they're blaming Moses, they're blaming Aaron, they're blaming everybody else. But we see here in Numbers 14, they brought that completely on themselves. All the things that they had to go through, all of the, 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 um, the hardships, the, the, the roaming, the lack of food, the lack of water, all the, the hardships that they endured was of their own doing. If they would have just trusted in God, if they would have just said, okay, we'll do this. You, you said it. God, we'll believe you. We'll, we'll, we'll do this. If they would have just done that, then they would have avoided all of these events that, that happened to them later. Now, this is also important to point out, too, is that even though the children did not commit the iniquity, they still had to bear the punishment with their parents. Right? God didn't hold the children responsible for... for um, you know, lacking faith and doubting. 
But because the parents did, they did doubt, now they're causing their children to suffer as well. And that's an important truth to remember because you got to remember this too. When you sin, when you decide to break God's commandments and just do whatever you want, you might think that that sin is only going to affect yourself. You might think that, hey, when I sin against God, well, I might have to pay for it, but that's it. And that's not the case. That's like almost never the case. When you sin, it's always going to impact somebody else. Whether you like it or not, whether you intend for that to happen or not, when you go out and sin, you're always impacting other people. And this is exactly what happened here with the children of Israel. They didn't have faith in God, and their children had to suffer for that. Now, is that fair for the children? I, mean, I wouldn't say it's fair, but, but it's not God's fault. right? God's not the one that's causing them to suffer. It was their parents' fault. That would be the people who were to blame for that. And you need to remember that when you decide to, to sin and do whatever you want, it's not just yourself that's going to be affected by that. There's always other people that, that are like collateral damage in your own sin. So when things are going bad in your life, again, you know, don't charge God foolishly. Don't think that it's a result of God causing these bad things to happen in your life. It's either from your own wickedness or from your own sin, or maybe it's from somebody else's sin that these bad things are happening, but it's not because of God. So, how could the children of Israel have handled the situation correctly? Let's, say, let's, let's try to take everything that we've seen and think about what they did. First of all, obviously, they should have had faith in God's Word. From the very beginning, God promised them. God made it clear that He was going to lead them into this promised land. He promised them, you know, it was a land flowing with milk and honey, and that it was going to be a good land, and Moses was going to lead them, and all they had to do was just follow them, and, and, um, and just have faith in God. And if they would have had faith in God, then none of this stuff would have moved them, right? But the second thing is, don't complain. We saw the children of Israel, they're, they're complaining and murmuring. That's what it means to murmur is complaining, right? They're going through a hard time. They're going through a difficult, rough patch in their life. And they're just complaining. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So you want to prevent yourself from getting this, this poor attitude of, of, oh, poor me, everything's going so bad, and just be content and think about the good things that you have in your life. Think about whatever's going good and, and thank God for it. Um, be content with those things. And he says, the reason why you can be content with those things you have it says, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Even if you lose everything, like Job did, where he said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return thither. He said, you can lose everything in this world, yet Jesus Christ, if you're saved, he will never leave you or forsake you. Amen. He'll never leave you. That is one thing you have confidence in, and that is one thing that will never be taken from you, and He will never leave you. That is one thing you will always have, and that is the best thing that you could possibly ever have. Even when everything else is gone, you can have Him, and you, and you can have that confidence. So there's no reason to complain when Jesus Christ will never leave you. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So all the good things you have anyways come from God. Bible says every good gift that you receive comes from God. And He's the one that, that, that gives you the good things. And again, important to remember that so that we don't get a, a proud attitude or thinking that we deserve, the world owes us everything, you know, we deserve to have all this stuff. God will give you the good gifts. And Jesus Christ is never going to leave you or forsake you, so don't, don't have this complaining, poor attitude. And then number three, you know, Ultimately, don't blame God or anyone else for your own problems. You know, the Bible says in James 1.13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. He's saying, you know, God's not the one tempting you with sin. God's not the one trying to get you to sin. That's the devil. 
God's not going to, you know, your own temptations happen, happen when your heart is tempted to sin against God. You're drawn away of your own lust and enticed. So don't go blaming God for, for whatever situation that you're in. Ultimately, I mean, that's, that's the, the, the worst thing you do is, just to, is, is to, have, to charge God foolishly. We all need to own up to our own actions and our own responsibility. And, and you know, the, the healthy attitude to have is if bad things happen to you, just think, what am I doing? You know, what have I done that's wrong? What can I change? You know, maybe it, maybe it is, maybe it's not from something you've done. I mean, maybe you are like Job and you're doing everything that's right. But the first thing you should do is just, is just consider yourself. <coughs> consider your own works and be like, hey, if bad things are happening, you know, I'm just going to try. Maybe it's from me, maybe it's not. I don't know. But I'm just going to try to do even better. I'm going to focus on helping other people out. I'm going to have the, the mind that, that Christ said that we should have, to have this type of an attitude. I'm not going to dwell on the things that are going wrong in my life. I'm not going to charge God foolishly. I'm not going to blame anyone else. I'm just going to, I'm just going to think, you know what? I'm just going to endure this and get through it and, um, and not have this attitude that like God owes me something or the world owes me something. Um, so, so just think about that. Think about your own attitude, you know, uh, in general. When things go wrong, when things aren't right, you know, um, maybe, think, maybe bad things are happening to you. And, and if things happen bad over and over again, the first place to look is at yourself. Just analyze your own life and say, well, am I doing everything that God wanted me to do? Because the children of Israel, they didn't do everything that, that God wanted them to do. They didn't have faith. They didn't obey Him. And they did have a whole bunch of hardship. They, they were wandering about in the wilderness, and there was a lot of bad struggles, a lot of, a lot of things that were happening in their life that could have been um, avoided if they would have just followed God from the beginning. And, um, you know, we know we're going to reap what we sow, so sometimes that is going to happen in our life. And, you know, um, I, I remember this personally, this in my life. I know before I got right with God, even after I was saved, I lived a life that was pretty sinful and pretty wicked. And I can't tell you right now if I've reaped everything that I've sown then. Don't know. But when bad things have to happen to me, I mean, it could be from, from years back. We don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. But um, I'm not going to have that proud attitude of thinking like, oh, well, I'm so good. None of this stuff could be ha should be happening to me. I've already sown wickedness. So if I start reaping bad things, if bad things are happening to me, I'm just going to say, well, it's probably from something I did. You know, I'm going to put the blame off on somebody else. Say, well, it's probably my own, my own wickedness, my own sin that's bringing this back upon me. And you think about sowing and reaping. When you sow a seed in the ground, you don't just reap the next day. Right? When you sow crops, when you sow a fruit tree or anything like that, you don't re reap that fruit in one day. You sow it to the ground and years later oftentimes, that's when you're going you're gonna to reap. And you think about sowing and reaping, you sow one little seed. But you end up reaping a lot. And that's why the Bible says in Proverbs, says, he that soweth to the wind you know, shall reap the whirlwind. I don't think I have that exactly perfect, but basically, you know, you're going to sow a little bit, you sow to the wind, you're going to reap the world. It's going to come back, you know, a hundredfold. It's going to come back, a, a, you know, a lot bigger than, than you think. So be careful with, with the works that you do. Be careful with, the, with, you know, how you live your life and the things that you decide to do. If you decide to sin against God, hey, just remember that that whatever you're sowing, you're going to reap again. God's not mocked. And, um, you know, like I said, if I were to go through any hard times, I'm just going to think that, well, I probably deserve it from something that I've done in the past. I'm not going to go around trying to put the blame off on anyone else. I'm going to examine my life, examine what I can do, and, and see how much better I can live for God, and just be focused in esteeming other people better than myself. And let's uh, bow our heads every word for Dear Lord, thank you so much for this for this passage. I know, um, God, sometimes I'm not the most eloquent speaker, dear Lord, and uh, I just pray that that the the thought of the message got across this morning, dear Lord, that from what you've taught me from Scripture, dear God, about um, about the attitudes we ought to have and not charging you foolishly for the for the wrong for the wickedness that we do or for bad things that happen in our lives, dear God. Lord, I, I pray that we'd all have a heart that would esteem others better than ourselves like you had for us, like Jesus Christ had, dear Lord, as, a, as the perfect example. God, help us to have this heart. Help us to have a heart that wants to win souls to Christ. Help us to have the heart to, to serve you more 
and, and to be humble, dear Lord, and not to think of ourselves better than we are and, and to just puff up our own minds and our own hearts, dear God. Help us to have a lowly, meek spirit like Moses had, dear Lord, who was willing to entreat for people even though they wanted to kill him, dear Lord. Help us to have that type of an attitude. And I know that if we have...